Anyway, yeah, it was um, but I, yeah, I enjoyed it, not just for the boobs. Um, yeah, yeah. Where that needs to be the, that needs to be the clip at the start, Ross. I did enjoy it. Not yeah, just for the boobs. In Britain, an ancient kingdom with legends of violence, cruelty, and torment in its blood. Join your hosts, Ross, John, and James, as they bravely tread where few would dare. Witness their journey into the horrific history of British horror. They are... The General Witch Fighters. Ladies and gentlemen, goblins and ghouls, welcome back to the 32nd episode of the General Witchfinders podcast. I'm James in Bournemouth in Southern England. I'm John Poutney and I'm here in South Wales, which is still frozen into the heart of the South of Wales. Ooh, and I'm Ross in very cold Dorchester on the, in Southern England. And this time we bring you a ghost, a ghost story, story for Christmas, Christmas double bit. Which will all come to you, the original. And stigma. This is a tale of the supernatural. It's the work of a man who wrote ghost stories as a sideline. The author, M.R. James, was an archaeologist, medieval historian, and a great expert on the early history of the Bible. He was vice-chancellor at Cambridge University during the First World War, and later became the provost of Eton, where he died in 1936. He's best known for his ghost stories, all of which have a peculiar atmosphere of cranky scholarship. The darkest of them is called Whistle and I'll Come to You. It's a story of solitude and terror, and it has a moral too. It hints at the dangers of intellectual pride and shows how a man's reason can be overthrown when he fails to acknowledge those forces inside himself which he simply cannot understand. Okay, so Whistle and I'll Come to You is a 1968 BBC television drama adaptation. The 1904 ghost story, Oh Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad, by M.R. James. It tells of an eccentric and distracted professor who happens upon a strange whistle while exploring a Knights Templar cemetery on the East Anglian coast. When blown, the whistle unleashes a frightening supernatural force. The production starred Michael Horden and was adapted and directed by Jonathan Miller. It was broadcast as part of the BBC Arts strand Omnibus and inspired a new yearly strand of M.R. James television adaptations, known as a ghost story for Christmas. Jonathan Miller adapted his 1968 version as part of the BBC Arts strand Omnibus, which normally consi uh, consisted mainly of arts documentaries. So the dramatic adaptation was an unusual move. This probably explains Miller's documentary-like introduction to the film. The adaptation itself changes a number of aspects of James's story, turning the academic, described in the story as young, neat and precise of speech, mm. into a bubbling, awkward, middle-aged eccentric. This adaptation was filmed on the Norfolk coast at Waxham and nearby. The performance of Michael Horden is especially acclaimed for his hushed mutterings and repetition of other characters' words, mm. coupled with a discernible lack of social skills, turning the professor from an academic caricature into a more rounded character, described by horror aficionado David Caracas uh, as especially daring for its day. The stage journal, Plays and Players, suggested that Horden's performance hints that the professor suffers from a neuro neurological condition called the idea of a presence. Much of the script was <laughs> much of the script was improvised on location with mm. the actors. Mm. So yes, so th this is the uh, probably the fourth time I've watched this one. Okay, and it's the first time I've watched it on DVD. Um, mm. The the uh, collected um, ghost stories have been on my Amazon wish list for a long time. Yeah, but I, I can never bring myself to pay as much as um. They want for it. And you can just get them on eBay. I think I bought mine on eBay for like 20 quid or no, something. No, I, I got mine in a uh, charity shop for, I think, mm. £25. And mm. I was really excited. And the and the day I found it, I realised that they were doing a release of, of, the blue, of it on Blu-ray rather than DVD. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> nah. should have just held out for that. However, 
it's still the best quality I've ever seen it because everybody ever watched yes. it on YouTube before. Yes, yes, yes. That was good. It was good to watch it on there. I've, I've got to say that it's a, a, such a pleasure to watch something good rather than a pile of shit like the uh, <laughs> Golden Vampires, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> it does it make is, for it, a much happier podcast. Well, it's, I think. it's all about it's all about peaks and troughs in the show. You know, it, it's, it's, it's more it's like true. endurance. <laughs> with, uh... Well, you you have um, given me the thumbs up for the next the next twelve months episode. So yes, far. I have. Although I have changed one of them already oh so what now oh i saw a film uh, made in 1985 where women's boobies get covered in jelly <laughs> well that's actually the second thing we're going to watch in a minute isn't it <laughs> um, <laughs> um, last night we were, we had um talking pictures on very late and i noticed that um uh, Confessions of a Window Cleaner was on <laughs> with um, friend of the podcast Robin Asquith. I don't know if yeah. he's a friend of the podcast, but um, I'd like him to be. But I also yeah. didn't realise until it was playing last night that it's direct- directed by Val Guest, who was also the director of the Quatermass Experiment. Wow. Ooh. Which is a pretty amazing cr- cr- career trajectory, isn't it? Oh, so it's a broad CV, isn't it? <laughs> That's incredible. That's it. So what I, I should point out that this was the first time that I've ever watched this version. Oh, okay. I saw that. I've seen the more modern one. Ah. And I've seen on, I think, when Mark Gassis did like his uh, really amazing horror yeah, yeah, series. Yeah. He talks about this and it features like a number of the seats yeah. as he talks yes. about it. So yeah. I felt immediately familiar with it. But yeah. Were you this was my first time. Well, you know, I'm yeah. just, I know what the story's about. Yeah. So this is the first time that I've watched it from absolute beginning to end. Mm. And as we were just saying in Ross's little, uh, you know, the bit of the, 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 uh, the introduction to the episode is the, the, the most remarkable thing is that it starts off with Jonathan Miller giving what I put down is amazing lecturer vibes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Straight off. He's like, right, listen up, everybody. And I've just put, this was a different time. Yeah. You couldn't do this now. No. You couldn't do that. Listen up, idiots. <laughs> and here's what the theme of this program are. And this yes. is what you need to know. Yeah, yeah, I thought yeah. it was so great. It's so refreshing. Just like yes. a clearly very intelligent man. A polymath um, of huge... Po- absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If, yeah. Dear listener, if you've yeah. never watched it, it's, it's available on YouTube. I really, really recommend watching uh, Jonathan Miller taking mm. apart Oh, Powell, um, Enoch Powell. Enoch Powell. Yeah. It's brilliant. Just Wanker. watch a man who's clearly very clever mm. just saying, look, I'm going to show you how, you know, why your ideas are so flawed and so wrong. Yes. Basically, without even having to sort of raise the, te- the the tone or the timbre mm. of his voice at any point. He's a great man. He's a great man, Jonathan Miller. Mm. But yeah, so I really enjoy it. So I just love that bit at the start. And just what I put is he mentions that he's a, that uh, he says, our character is a man who's lived his life in cranky scholarship. Cranky scholarship, yeah. <laughs> and I've just put, that's my life's game. That's my life's goal. <laughs> I, I, I want it put on my gravestone. He lived his life in cranky scholarship. Not of, not scholarship of the crankies. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole different podcast. Yeah. Um, it, this also... Um uh, continues the tradition of nice fonts on the beginning. Uh, oh, I, think yeah. it, I think that was um, avant garde or something like that. I think. It's the whole thing is just a beautiful object, isn't it? Not one shot is out of place. It looks great in black and white. Um, yeah, like you say, the typefaces are really well judged and well chosen because it looks kind of modern, even though it's. I mean, the whole thing really looks very timeless, doesn't it? Because yeah. it, yes. 1968, but it could have been made last week, or it could have been made in the 30s, mm. really. Yes. Parts of it look like silent, silent cinema. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we open um, with um, um, some maids making the bed, which is a bit of a foreshadow for what's yes. coming up later. Yeah. First thing I thought was, like, oh, I really miss having a bed with like sheets on top of me and a, and a blanket. Really? Yes. Yeah. And an eider down. Yeah. And an I noted down eider down because my grandmother had an eider down. I remember it being very, very exciting when we got our first duvet um, in our house. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, um, Cleaver is appearing on this podcast from um, the year 1879. <laughs> we did. Well, we, yeah. I, I do feel like my sort of, uh, my house was a little bit behind. We used to have a paraffin heater in our bedroom. And, um, oh my God. <laughs> and it, so it felt like my parents waited till I left home before they got central heating. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then they anything. never switch it on. Yeah. <laughs> no, God, no one's no one well, we did, on. Yeah, we didn't have... Um, I've never had a house with central heating until I lived in Cardiff because the farm I grew up on certainly didn't have wow. se- 
it barely had heating, let alone yeah. centralized heating. But I think um, central heating is a very modern uh, well, we're, luxury. We're, we're isn't all it, going really? backwards now. I, the other day, I had to go to one of our neighbours who um, I got a car and they took in a package for us. Mm. And I was like, oh, I don't think they're in. So I'll try. So I knocked on the door. <laughs> And I just, this, just let myself in. <laughs> yes. And I saw this torch coming down the down the um uh down the hallway through mm. their door. And uh, it was a guy that he had like one of those head torches on. And he goes, "Oh yeah, right. I'm going to get right. you." And he said, "Are you are you an opt- on octopus?" And I said, "What?" And he said, "Are you on octopus energy?" And I said, "No." And he said, oh, yes. "We are." And he said, "If we don't turn our energy on, don't, have, don't use any energy between four and six. They'll give us a bit of money. So we're just sitting in here." I'm in the dark. In the dark. <laughs> and I said, oh, what's she going to get? He goes, I don't know, a couple of quid. And I said, oh, we're, we're, we're with Octopus. So. Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah it'd be for like, is it come to this? Like, you're, yeah. you're sitting there in the dark. He said, oh, we're having a glass of wine and, and, li- and listen to the, um, yeah, it's on, over. On, the on the iPad. I yeah, said, 20, 21st century Britain is yeah. on its knees. It's a failed state. It's a failed state. If, yeah, if you're listening abroad, dear listener, <laughs> Don't come here. <laughs> it's, all, it, it's horrible. It's, if you can hear this, apart. you are the resistance. <laughs> <laughs> so it all starts with a scene of a beach with a very nice superimposed moon. Oh, mm. I thought it was the sun. Oh, yeah. Well, have I? I've written superimposed moon, but it is a sun. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Which I think is nicely done. But also the opening scene of Stigma. stigma it's a red sun. Has a has a superimposed mm. red sun, which turns into the car, doesn't it? Yes. Mm. Um, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, mm. So then you've got your your um, forward from our. Well, I don't know if it is Jonathan Miller. Is it Jonathan it Miller himself? Or, oh, all like right, Jonathan okay. Miller. I would say, and then I would put money on it. We basically go straight into the opening scene, which is the bed being made, and then we have Professor Parkin, who is Prof. Prof. prof- Professor Parkins in the original oh, okay. story. It's a strange um, change to make. Yeah. Um, he gets a taxi, which he pays for with two coins, I noticed. Yeah. I, I definitely Brilliant. ever pay a taxi with coins that one. One and six or something, yeah. isn't it? Uh, and then we go straight into what, I, it, what, because I've seen this so many times. I was thinking about it before it started this time. And I think it's a program which is very much about um, utterances, silence, mm. Um, mm. ennui, boredom. There's an entire scene where a man describes the facilities of the hotel and doesn't actually use a word. Yeah. yeah. He's just like... Mm. Mm. And it's it's quite hard to describe that until you've yeah. seen it visually, isn't it? Yeah. And, that, yeah. and, and I think that's something which does lend itself to the feel of it being a bit like a silent film. Well, it? Yeah, yes. I thought that bit was, yeah, it was a little bit of comedy in there as well, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But it was what it was the whole thing about the awkwardness of silences, mm. isn't it? And and how yes. if you're a little bit anxious about it, that you've you just got to feel that, that, that silence. And, Which and, is what Parkin does. Because yeah. he's like, uh, I don't do play golf, uh, barely at all, if ever. Or that it's just yeah. that kind of constant. Yeah. It's just cobblers that he's talking, isn't it? This is one of the uh, one of the um, only things I've seen on television where you're kind of getting a insight into the person's thoughts because mm. you can, he's almost having this conversation with himself all yeah, the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's really interesting that because whenever uh, I hope Beck doesn't mind me saying this, if I sometimes I'll be like in the kitchen <laughs> washing up and I can see her out in the garden doing like she's putting the washing out, and I can see her just talking to herself oh, and really? going, going for whole sort of conversations and. You know, sort of like, and it's like, she says, yeah, I do it all the time. I practice conversations. I practice conversations. And then, mm. and when you sort of, when you don't, you, when you start walking around and start looking, well, I don't, I don't walk around looking at people, but you do notice a oh, lot yeah. of people chat away to themselves all the time. Yeah. And it's, and I was reading this thing in, um, 14 times saying that, um, that that'd be bastion business. of science. Yeah, of course you were. Yeah. 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 They've do yeah. they done something about the inner monologue, and they, they said yes. that the majority of people do have an inner, mon- an inner monologue, and it is their own voice just talking to them. And, and it's, it, Whereas some people don't, and I don't think I do, but they were mm. saying oh. you can have some kind of, um, some, there's, if you can have some kind of like brain damage where you lose that inner voice. Mm. Um, and they said, and the person, one of the people described it, they said it, it, it was just incredibly quiet all the time that I don't have mm. someone talking to me all the time. And, but you can see this guy, there's a point where he sees a woman looking at him uh, when he's having a meal 
Yeah. And you can see, it's almost like seeing like he would really love to talk to her, but he can't do it. But he has, he has that conversation yes. yeah, in yeah, his yeah, head yeah, yeah, what, yeah, what yeah, he would yeah. say to her. Potentially, my, yes. My, my point from this is that they all seem quite amazed that he's on his own. Mm. Mm. Right. And I've put down, like, this is something that I've done. Does it, like, when I, uh, when I, the, back in 2017, I moved mm. to this, like, in my new flat, and it was immensely stressful. It was really, when, you know, when you move, it was a really, really stressful period. And it'd be, oh, it, it was a really, and just a rough couple of months to, to yeah. do with things like getting the deposit back from my old flat and things like that, and literally just running out of place. money. That <laughs> ad flood in the old flat. When he's, when he's trying to help me, all, all kinds of things like this. So I thought, I just want to go and have like a couple of weeks away. I just want to get away. And I went and stayed. I went to, I went and stayed in the Three Cocks Inn, John. Which I've No been, way. Yeah, yeah. Good yeah. God. Yeah. Where I once yeah, so, knocked myself out on a beam. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that exact the same place. Right? Because, dear listener, this is um, just, <laughs> this is just outside of, where is it? Just hey, on why? Thank you, mate. My brain, my mind's gone blank. Um, so this is just outside of Hay on Wye. I'd always wanted yeah. to go to Hay on Wye. Yeah. And stayed in a place called the Three Cocks Inn. And there's a very yeah. nice pub over the road. There is, and yeah, both, yeah, yeah. And both, in both locations, while I was there, people were going yeah. to me, I asked why are you here? I was like, well, it's, I'm on holiday at the moment. I just, I just wanted yeah. a little break. Yeah. And they were like, are you here on your own? I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it really weirded people out. And in the morning, when I was having breakfast... There were like a couple of other sort of couples, and I think yeah. like uh, a family of four. And you can see yeah. them all just like looking at me, like, "What is that guy on his own? What's he doing here?" It's a very, think- it's a very Jamesian idea, and I don't mean you yeah. as in James yeah, yeah, Randall, yeah, yeah, yeah. M- Mr. Jamesian, to have bachelors yeah. go into places on their own to look at like um, you know effigies or carvings yeah. or yeah, or yeah. very close to there, James. Helen mm. and I went to one of the friendless churches. Yeah. Uh, which is near a, a, a ruined uh, Victorian asylum and um, Hel oh, had a very a strong supernatural uh, experience where she saw um, women being drowned. Whoa. And we found out later that the church was very close to where they used to do um, witch ducking in the like 17th century. Wow. Now, and just to add to extra sugar and spice on this, yes, is, yes. For, for Ross's case, John mm. told Kirsty and I about this when we went down for mm. John's exhibition. Mm. And when Kirsty and I went to Wales in the holidays, we were like, we'll try and find that place. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we couldn't find it because we realized that you would need like an, a, like an ordnance survey map. It, it just was, it was so off the beaten track. Yes. But the village that's nearby, it's got a weird vibe. <laughs> like a really weird, kind of deserted, everything was shut up. That, that's just and Wales, was, James. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but both of us were just like, something feels off and wrong about yes. this place. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So just, yeah, yeah, the general environs, it feels a bit weird. Well, well I used to have to do a lot of travel on my own for work, like mm. Germany, Dubai, mm. uh, New York. And I'm not showing off. I'm just saying, like, going around to these places. And you do get I don't that. remember any of this, Cleves. When, when was this? A couple of different... Um, it was two... Uh, so Dubai was two jobs, three jobs ago. Right. And, oh, yeah. Uh, I didn't remember. Is that when you went to that restaurant where you got served by dwarves? Yeah. No, I remember. I didn't realise that the... Um, the the, the, the Major D came up and it was a dwarf. And I thought, okay, they, they, they've got a... Uh, there's a dwarf here. But then... It, then I noticed when they, when the waiter came, he was a dwarf as well, and I realised everyone in there were dwarfs. And um, yeah, but that, um, that that wasn't the only weird thing in there. Were everyone, these, everyone was did, smoking it at the tables, and that was weird as well. So it was just it was like Dubai there. Yeah, what Dubai. kind of dwarves were they? Were they Dubai Dubaian dwarves, or were they like <laughs> dwarves from around I, the world? They were the Caucasian dwarves, so they must be shit. Really? Oh. So there's what? like a, a <laughs> kind of um, enclave of dwarves there. Yeah. Maybe, it'll it'll maybe. side between the pantos, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> and I um, decide if I'm going to need this. Films. Maybe when and they were drilling like, yeah. for um, uh, coal, they sort of broke into one of their caves and they, they just all poured out. <laughs> I won't put that in. Theory, drilling maybe. for coal? <laughs> no, drilling for oil. I mean, oil. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know if you've got <laughs> much of a grasp of industrial history, please. <laughs> drilling for coal. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, could, I have that. S- I, I have an understanding of sort of like just wandering around places because you've got nothing mm. to do. Mm. There's no one else around because everyone's mm. inside their room. And there's a bit when he's sort of like just looking at the, the newspapers. Yes. And, and, and you just like spend ages doing 
things that would Nothing. normally take you a yeah, yeah, it wouldn't yeah, take you yeah, a long yeah. time at all just to fill that time because you yes. know you know I've done all my work you know it, then was then was awake back at home so I no, can't yeah. anyone and yeah I do like um, one of the things I like Mr James for and this film and um, a warning to the curious is the kind of deep um, dive or whatever they call it these days, you get into the world of like hospitality in the Victorian times mm. where mm. someone would turn your bed down. And run some, your bath. Got, yeah, someone would run your bath, run but your there's bath no bloody there, yeah. um, bubble bath in it. So yeah. it's just like, it's just like still water, which yeah. looks really yeah. strange to modernize. I was thinking how, how much you'd have to pay to be in a hotel where someone would run you a bath. Run now. a bath <laughs> these days, yeah. Um, you'd have a guy, the boots, who would come and, um, you know, polish your shoes for you yeah. and potentially, like, re yes. your shoes and stuff. So it's a whole world of skills which are now kind of, well, se- it's either seen as being super luxurious or kind of bizarre now, aren't yeah. they? Um, so he goes off for a couple of, what did he call it? A yomp or, a, um, <laughs> or something along those lines? Something like that, yes. Yeah, a trudge. A trust. Yeah, it's spooky, he says. That yeah. It's spooky. Uh, it's spooky. Um, yeah. <laughs> Just wanders along the beach. Um, uh, it's amazing. It, it's basically the life mm. I want to have. I really want to go to Norfolk. I've never been to Norfolk except to collect a, a Road Rate 100 that I bought once. Yeah. Um, and it's just trudging along, meandering, isn't it, really? And also, I think it, it's very interesting because I'm, I'm aware that sort of like MR James, because of his sort of... Uh, associated with Cambridge. Cambridge is quite close to Norfolk and things such mm. as that. But he would have known that locale very well. Yes, and of yeah, course, yeah, it's yeah. also the same location for Warning for the Curious, wasn't it? Mm. And it's just that whole Fens kind of thing of where does land and sea begin? Yeah, definitely. Doesn't it? It's that whole kind of, that has that mysterious property as to mm. where, you know, that degree of ancientness. Mm. I mean, our old favourite, the Sutton Hoo horde. <laughs> that whole kind of like ancient Britons plus, the, you know, a hinterland between the land and the sea. Mm. And it's it's just immediately, all of those things are really evocative and like, yes. ooh, spooky. And like you, John, I was like, oh, I'm going to have a look around here. Okay, it's so appealing. please go and become a patron of ours. Um, <laughs> so for three, three pound a, a month would help us get a little bit of money together and we, we could actually record a... a, 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 a General Our own for the curious. Yeah. Travelogue. Yeah, yeah, you can do your little travelogue. Of, like of Witch's in, World. Yeah. <laughs> Witch's World. Witch's yeah. World. Um, I, I've, I've not done very good notes on this. Well, does it, so basically, <laughs> well, he, he goes to a graveyard. Which uh, is amazing. We should point out that yeah. the, the graveyard is, again, bearing in mind that this would have been done on quite a small budget. Yes. Really. The the graveyard, how they've made it look, is amazing in it the term that it's, it's, it's like, probably the best graveyard of all time, isn't it? It's it's like an abandoned graveyard. It doesn't yes. seem to be attached to a church. No. It seems to be like well, it's, it's on the edge of nature is reclaiming it. It's because yes, some of the, the sea is eroding it away. Eroding uh, it away. And um on the erosion of the sea is is um uh, revealed some bones from a, a, a um a grave, grave. Um, mm. which he goes and starts pulling the bones out, which is like I wouldn't do that. Uh, <laughs> and then finds a little uh, recorder or whistle. Whistle, yes. Yeah. So um, in the in the original story, this is a uh, Knights Templar preceptory, which is not the or preceptory. I'm not sure how you pronounce mm. it. Which is the kind of monastery of the Knights Templar, who someone else asks him to visit it, and this is what this is why oh. he ends up finding it in the original story. Um, and then he finds the, the whistle in a kind of what he thinks might have been an altar, whereas this is slightly different, where it's protruding yes. out of the kind of cliffside, isn't yeah. it? I, I, um, I said to Beck, who was half watching this, mainly mm. complaining about the the eating noises um, mm. uh, that, that he was making all the fruit. So do I have? To uh, it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in there. Oh, a delicious breakfast. Oh, uh, grapefruit. Grapefruit. grapefruit disgusting. What does uh, he have? Haddock. Does haddock. he have haddock? Uh, I'd love oh. a bit of haddock for breakfast, but grapefruit, I can't stand grapefruit. Oh, my nan used to have grapefruit for breakfast. This is, oh, Lots of things in this make me think of how attached I still am to the era that this shows yeah. mm. through living with, with my someone. nan, who yeah. was born in 1910. Yeah. So a lot of this now is will be totally lost to the current generation, but to someone like me... This looks doesn't look that dated, which is quite weird. But, so I said to Beck, "Would you take that out of there?" She said, "No, I would, I would not, I would not <laughs> take that. anything out of a grave." Mm. Um, but 
uh, strange. I, when I went on holiday to Cornwall last, I was watching this brilliant um, archaeology program on mm. BBC Four, where they basically mm. they go around lots of different um, sites around the country and they um, do like updates on it. And there is yeah. an actual um, I can't remember where it was, but there's a uh, like a cliff face which is being slowly eroded away, and they're saying there's loads of skeletons in there. And I think I've seen this as well. You can literally yeah. go there and pull ribs and um, oh leg bows out of it. And they're, they're saying they think this is all to do with um, uh, like smugglers and uh, yeah. as if someone died, rather they, they would just bury them near the, <laughs> near the, the side of the sea so no one would yeah, see yeah, them yeah. and stuff. Yeah, it was really interesting. But they said they have to keep closing it down. Every time it happens, which the police have to be in, in, involved yes. every time you find. Um, other great uh, graveyards in um, films, I would nominate... Um, the graveyard at the start of um, James Wells' Frankenstein mm. and the graveyard at the start of Great Expectations, the David Lean version. Yeah. That's probably the best opening 20 minutes to a film that I can imagine. The rest of the film I'm not so keen on, but that gothic mm. start with the fens and the, and the stuff. That, and M.R. James, I can't remember which M.R. James story it is now, but he does mention the opening, the landscape, of the, of the story of his setting is similar to the the start of Great Expectations. So put picture yourself there, dear listener, in that kind of gothic hinterland. Our chap, what's his name? Parkin. 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 Um, takes the whistle back to the um, hotel mm. and, and starts digging away at it with a, a pen knife, cleaning it up. Dirty, and- dirty, dirty. <laughs> and he notices... Uh, a um, hundred things a boy can boy do. Can do. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen this so many times. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to explain what that bit, what that means? Well, it, I, I've no idea, but I presume it's like a book or something yes. that can tell you how you can um, decrypt. A, um, well, just how to do etchings and yeah, things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they're used to, I can remember from, from the 80s, from our childhood, yes. there was like a, a bumper book for boys and a bumper yeah. book for girls. Yeah. Yeah. Like, here's things you can do, kids, yeah. prior to the internet, of course. When you're not on your phone, on your SNES. <laughs> wow, <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, they used, there was a brass rubbing centre in Stratford-on-Avon, which I went to fairly regularly as a teenager and young young yeah we have some rubbings up in our living room i I bet you did i don't know what happened to him (laughs) 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 nothing to do on those dark nights (laughs) yeah gather around the paraffin heater yeah the hiss of the paraffin heater and the sound of the the rubbing um have we mentioned that the maids are laughing Yes. No, we it's, haven't. But uh, well, the yeah. maids laugh, and that is a bit which is also directly lifted from the original story. But I mm. don't know. I think it's um, uh, number thirteen where the maid laughs at a question that the uh, protagonist asks, um, and then he says something about the maid laughed in the way that maids do, or something like mm. that. So it's. I think this is made by someone who has an obvious love for the. Uh, content and the you know knows yeah. their subject. The new, those are MR James. Yes. Dirty. Hmm. Inscription. Hmm. One hundred and one things a boy can do. Quiz.
Yeah, so he, um, using a pencil, uh, he rubs uh, on a bit of paper to reveal a, an engraving, which is in Latin. Yes. Uh, did anyone write down what that... What, what, I didn't, but I know what the translation is. is. Yes. It's, it's, we haven't mentioned that as he's leaving the beach where he's found his crystal, oh, yes. he turns back to see that there's a silhouette in of the, someone. In the fa- far distance, yes. Yeah. Yes, who looks Excellent. like they're following him. And that happens in the story. Yeah. And he, in the story, um, he has a kind of, uh, well, not flashback, but a kind of... Um, vision of um the rhyme of the ancient mariner yes. and the, and a section where you know if you look behind and see some kind of foul phantom behind you how would you uh, mm. react not knowing that he is actually being followed yeah. by the foul phantom yes, exactly. which is you know the point of the story really isn't it Again, yeah. Uh, what, yeah. what we find with so many of these that we watch is that it's you know the idea of the rational person being con- confronted with the irrational things they can't mm-hmm. really rationalize yeah, yeah. so yeah. um i was going to say that but the vision of the, the out of focus figure in the distance made me think of the zygons in the paintings in um uh, the day of the doctor <laughs> <laughs> but you, you were going to say, say that but i, I thought yeah. john would laugh at me so um, um i haven't seen the day of the doctor since it was on so oh, i my, can't remember my kids watch it like once a week um, do they really yeah so they love matt smith they just can't get enough of them <laughs> the other day they watched an episode which had the um uh it, it was the one before uh the time uh the uh, age of manhattan where their favorite amy and roy leave and they were freaking out because they didn't want they didn't even want to see the trailer of the episode when they would leave because they just want to keep watching them go round and round and round forever and forever um uh, how strange yeah well they are my children <laughs> <laughs> so the the, transla- the translation of the inscription says yes. Is, is, do you want to say it? Or should I say it? Who is this? Who is Kanda? Nice job. Nice. <laughs> That's good. Okay, it's something like qui est, or is it, it? It might be different in the film to what it is in the story. Actually, yeah. But I am th- no. Mm. I am no lat- Latinista. I have no knowledge of Latin. But as soon as he says it. The, the sound changes. You can Squeaky hear, yes. bum time there. Yeah, you can hear the wind, and I think this is. Th- then you start seeing him because every time you see him, even when he's on his own, he's mumbling mm. to himself. Yes, yeah, he's yeah, switching. Yeah. You can see there's a conversation going on in his head, but he's half uttering. Yeah. But then after this is happening, you see him to completely silent and mm. listening. Like he can hear something. Like yeah, yeah, you can yeah. hear something ca- in, in distance coming. And yeah, you, that's a very good point. Never thought of that. And you can, it's almost like you can hear the wind, you can kind of hear the sea and there's almost like a, 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 a flapping of like, of yes. fabric. In the it. sound design of this is very, very good considering it was made for TV in the 1960s when mm. most people would have been watching this on the tiniest screen with the shitter speakers. Um, when he in the story, when he blows the whistle, there's an amazing line which is it had the quality of infinite, infinite distance in it, which I think is an amazing Ooh, kind of. Uh, yeah, and assessment. then as he looks out the window, he sees the white, um, white wing of a seabird flying by in the night. Mm. But then when you think back later, you think, is that a seabird or is it this mm. bloody thing which presents itself later on in the story? I'm not gonna divulge what it is quite yet yeah. so um, then we have him uh, watching this and the the second one there's two points where I, I thought this is a really um good rendition of, of the sort of things which you you experience when when you're half asleep or you're awake from a dream yes. i often yeah, wake yeah. up because I feel like what's I've heard, in the corner uh, yeah or i've heard, I've heard a heard loud noise for me it's like I've, it's like i've heard a loud noise and then it's almost like as I wake up, it's there's a deafening silence because obviously it wasn't a real sa- real sound. It was like my, yes, and there's a couple of points in this film where you hear that loud noise, which is just it's switched off straight away as soon as you. I can imagine eyes. you sleeping like this, Cleves. I thought it while I was watching it that you'll be a t- twitchy sleeper because he- hell is the worst twitchy sleeper, and if anything disturbs her within ten or twenty minutes after she's gone to sleep, she will wake up with the most terrifying kind of just sitting bolt upright in bed, elbowing me oh. in there, and then she'll think she's seen like something that's like crushing me or, you know, 
demented. And, yeah. I, and I imagine you are, are like that, please. Yeah, I am. I am not, <laughs> I'm not terrorist. There's lots of... <gasps> Yeah, <laughs> Beck said the worst thing is that if she comes home and I'm asleep, she she said she hates the idea of coming up the stairs, but she knows that I'm going to freak out. <laughs> <laughs> and my mum said I was like, ever since I was a baby, said if you walk past a cot, I would like go, you know, rigid. <laughs> You were in a cot until you were 14, though, clearly. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With, like, a baby's cap on and a, and a dummy. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, what a the, terrifying image. More terrifying than anything in this film. It, it's true. I don't know. The sound, the mute, the sound in this is terrifying. Yes. Really. The sound in this is, is it's bang on. I've got to be honest. So the ne- the next day he um he sorry I'm doing our, our dreadful thing of never saying names but the next the next morning Parkin isn't it? Yeah. no 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 so because because Parkin then gets into conversation with the other kind of man who's staying in the hotel yeah the one who went oh it's all a bit spooky earlier on to him and he says oh spooky. do you believe it is spooky and he says oh do, do you believe in ghosts and what I've written down is. This is one hundred percent undergraduate philosophy that you're getting. Yeah, Do we get James thought, this is this is philosophy this is Jonathan. Corner? No, I thought this. I thought this probably isn't in the short story. John might be able no, to tell it me isn't. otherwise. It I was going to say this no. felt like Jonathan Miller. Jonathan yeah. Miller having been sat in an undergraduate lecture on philosophy and it just being utterly transposed. And look yeah. out, listener, I'm about to put on my philosophy hat again. Is that what he give, gives? Is he says, <laughs> "Oh, do you believe in ghosts?" And he says, "Well, the question here is, Ooh. what are you talking about belief?" And it's that whole thing of sort of knowledge through induction, things that you have seen for yourself. And what can you reasonably be said to believe in, even if you have not seen it with your own two eyes? Mm. And so he gives the example of Australia. And he's like, well, I... Australia can use a large continent. Four four large cities and things like that. (laughs) Ghost. That's rather a sticky one, isn't it? I'm not quite certain what you mean. I mean... I'm never quite certain what I'm being invited to believe when anybody asks me a question like that. I'm not even quite certain what I'm being invited to disbelieve when it comes to that. We're quite with you, old chap. No, well, well, I mean, you ask me, do I believe in, say, Australia? Well, now I know perfectly well what sort of thing I'm being asked to judge. I mean, we all agree what we mean by Australia. <laughs> Large continent, southern hemisphere, discovered by Captain Cook. Four or five large cities, kangaroos, and so on and so on. And given that, given that, one can perfectly well imagine the sort of procedure that one might put in hand to confirm, or on the other hand, to disconfirm its existence. But not quite the same thing with ghosts. Does he? So he kind of gives a, uh, a, a rundown to say, well, it's it's logical to believe in Australia because there's so much evidence around Australia. Mm. You know, I've never been there, but I can conclude yeah, quite safely a, that a there is an Australia. Of what it is as well. Mm. Yes. Whereas he says, oh, but the thing with ghosts is, well, what is it that we're talking about exactly? And then he gets very linguistic philosophy, which at this point, you know, Wittgenstein, my man, my, you know, my favorite philosopher of all time, this only would have been, Wittgenstein would have only been writing this stuff sort of 30 years before 1968. No way! So yeah, 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 yeah. Like, by the way, Wittgenstein died in the 1950s. Oh, I know. Doing... No idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you think about it, you're like now, when you now when we look back, and, oh my god, well, the year 2000, that's 22 years ago, no, and that feels like five minutes ago. So I imagine <laughs> that Miller is probably, you know, this is probably he's probably being taught it by someone who was either a contemporary of Wittgenstein yeah, or something point, along yeah. those lines, and he says. Oh, well, he said, it certainly has the grammatical appearance of a real question, but does that actually mean anything? And that's what I just put 100% of philosophy lecture here. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's pretty much what he, what he just says. And he kind of then, then says, well, you know, what do you actually mean by this? And is that a meaningful question that you can ask? And then when he, when, uh, Parkin says, says this, well, is, is, do you think this is a meaningful question? Uh, the guy says, You've bought me a Chinaman, old boy. <laughs> Which I feel, just in case, again, for our, maybe our, our foreign listeners, that is in cricket. That is a, uh, a very particular and idiosyncratic style of cricket delivery known as, known as a Chinaman. It's a, a, a form of left-hand spin. But mm. anyway, so in other words, it, it's uh, an idiot, you know, it's an idiom for you've, you've, 
thrown an unexpected question at me there. So there's that. And he then kind of concludes by saying, you know, that classic, you know, the classic line from Hamlet, which is there are more things to write mm. than a dream in heaven and earth, Horatio, than a dreamt of in your philosophy. Um, and to which, uh, Parkin. Uh, to which Parkin says back, oh, well, there's more things in philosophy than a dreamt of in your heaven and earth. And what I put is, Typical philosopher laughing at his own jokes. <laughs> yeah. Trust Smug me, lads. Bastard. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's as Descartes would say. <laughs> One has to look at all the angles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think this scene is brilliant. It's probably one of the best scenes in every, any of the things that we've watched mm. uh, in terms of it illuminating what the films are about that we are watching mm. and i think you could do a whole podcast probably on this one scene couldn't you yep. because yep. it raises so many issues yep where it's just like do you believe in ghosts and you're like uh, what do you mean yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's like until I, I think until i watch this uh film it's like well yeah actually what you know what is a ghost meant to be? We've got mm. no idea because the guy says, you know, it revives spirits of people or, you mm. know, and it's like, is that, no one's ever said really what a ghost is, what's have the, they? Mm. What's with this and all religion for me is that I, I always, I, I feel I feel like I can't believe in anything anyone's telling me because this is all what something humans are articulating and if there is mm. anything, anything metaphysical or anything uh any reason to the universe or any, any kind of something which created anything or there's a reason for anything to be happening mm. it's going to be way 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 more complicated than anything we could ever comprehend mm. so therefore anything you come up with is going to be even if you're on the right tracks it's going to be like one millionth of 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 one millionth of the actual whole of what it actually is and we would never be able to see all of it anyway and so mm. this is similar to what he's saying here but what do you mean by ghosts because you know mm. something along those lines could exist but the fact that there's it's completely out of our sensory um uh, experience there's nothing mm. there's nothing we can grasp onto in order to talk about it and mm -hmm. every, and there's so many different people talk about uh different things in different ways but they still call it a ghost and like like mm. you said but I, I, if I say I believe in that, what mm. does that mean to this person? And, mm. and yeah, and it, and it makes me question the same thing. Like someone said, oh, I'm a Christian, but mm. what as a Christian means a completely different things to one person than another. And it's yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Don't, don't worry, ladies and gentlemen. We will be getting back to obscure Doctor Who references <laughs> and, and references to sitcoms in due course. You're listening to Philosophy Today with the Terrible <laughs> <Witch> Funds. <laughs> that got very serious then. John, John, were any Doctor Who, were any Doctor Who episodes filmed entirely on 16mm film? Uh, uh, <laughs> Doctor Who stories, one Doctor Who story. Because oh, okay. what I don't like is what happens these days is that stories now from the classic run of Doctor Who are now called episodes. I'm sorry. I will have uh, in my... And, and, that's, and that's to mistake what is a segmented form of the story with the story itself. Yeah, I'm sorry. So were any stories so, of Doctor Who filmed entirely on 16mm? Yes, be ahead from space, oh, please. Okay, good. <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah, okay. I think... We, I don't know. I mean, we could cover it. <laughs> it's, it's, where, it's where the BBC... And the Doctor Who production team see what ITC are doing with their colour serials and they think, we're going to have a bit of that. We're going to have a man of action. We're going to have TV's John Pertwee from the Navy <laughs> Lark and he's going to be the, he's going to change Doctor Who into the hero. Yeah, James Bond, basically. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm so excited I could watch it I was it very now. proud of my daughter the other day. Um, yeah. So I, she, I showed her rear window, uh, mm. the Hitchhiker's rear window, and she loved it and she keeps watching it over and over. So yes. I thought, okay, I'm going to educate her on Hitchcock. I showed her um, Psycho, freaked her out. She wouldn't go to bed. Which is a little bit misguided, please, yes, I've got to be honest. So now no, I'm trying... not, not a parent of the year, though. Yeah, so, yeah, so I've kind of regretted that. But then I showed her some trainers of other Hitchcock films so she could pick the next one. Yes. Um, we decided on Dial M for Murder is going to be the next one. Because That's we, a good one. Yeah, Grace, very good. Uh, Grace Kelly. Uh, it's Grace Kelly, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes, yeah. it is, yeah. Um, but she did see the trainer for um, North by Northwest. She goes, that's just James mm. Bond. They're just trying to be James Bond. And I was like, yeah, very good. 
they basically just invented James yeah, Bond. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, back to... I would say, Cleves, that the best one to show up, I think... Oh, I'm just checking which one. The Lady Vanishes we're going to watch as well. Uh, Shadow of a Doubt. Oh, okay. I think Shadow of a Doubt is his best film, and I think he thought Ooh. Shadow of a Doubt was his best film as well. Okay. And it is... What's your show? I Rope. That was good. Rope's Rope good. is good, but it's it can be quite slow. Um, I don't know what, um, I don't know what, uh, what certification uh, Shadow of a Doubt is, but it's very good. There we are. Carry on. And then yes. that then builds up to our finale when, first of all, he, I want to, he, first of all, he has his dream, doesn't oh, he? Oh, brilliant. Where Best he dream dreams he's, ever. Be, mm-hmm. he's being, dreams he's being pursued. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing sound. And the sound yeah. production is great. The, it's all great. The pacing is great. Then he has a bit of a Sunday vibe mm. where the bustling busyness of the previous two days, you now see the hotel kind of empty, don't mm. you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And that for me is, uh, I hate Sundays. I've always hated Sundays because of Songs the vibe. Of praise, of, praise. Songs of praise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> bloody um, Last of the Summer Wine. And then you've got to get up for school in the morning yeah. and, no- and just nothing happening. And he's just basically sat by the fire and he's not doing anything that's very bored. And I think it perfectly encapsulates that kind of vibe. That's not in the film. It, that's not in the book. Either, it's another reason honest, you, you don't like Sundays is that we make you do a podcast on it. <laughs> <laughs> I've hated Sundays since about 1985. When I think I could first understand what a Sunday was. <laughs> you had that realisation you sat bottle right up yeah. in bed. Yeah, Sunday. Yeah, Sunday, um, bloody Sunday. Yeah, but I just think, yeah, it just gets it very well, doesn't it? It really pinpoints that kind of feeling of unease when you're like, I'm bored, I can't really think of anything to do. So this or- is this is the day, um, the uh, the May Satan, um, which bed do you want us to put the idea down on? Mm-hmm. Mm. Because what do you mean? Uh, well, my bed. He goes, well, which bed? Because yes. you both beds. Bed? Both beds have been slept in. Yeah. And which is, uh, yeah, give me the shivers just thinking about uh, yeah. that aspect of it as well. Um, yeah. So he comes upstairs and he said, well, I obviously own in one bed. Yeah. Who else has been in the room? I'm not in the habit of changing beds in the middle of the night. Yeah. Um, they're saying that the only people who've got the keys are the maids and him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, but he, I think he dismisses it because he's scared of it. You can see at that point. Yes, he does. He does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, phenomena, phenomena. And then he just walks off because he can't kind of grasp what's happened, no. really. I, I seem to remember in the book, there's there's more of that of stuff going on where he knows there's something in the other bed opposite him. I think that happens on, over a couple of nights. In, yeah. the, in the story, he um, comes back to the hotel from the golfing links with the um, general or major or whatever he is. And the, a little boy has seen the ghost in the room and runs into them very scared. And basically they're like, well, who's in the room? It, it, you know, I'm the, I should be the only one with a key. So who's in the room? So they go back to the room and find that the bed has been messed with. And then there's this, I, you know, there's this detective work to work out you know, who's been in the bed, but it's obvious all along that something has happened, which isn't quite right. And I think in the story, he kind of convinces himself that it was, you know, a maid who was kind of called away in the middle of making the bed or something like that. But obviously what you've got here with this is that you see the scene, the first scene is the making the bed, isn't it? So it's like that kind of, when you go, it's interesting this film because it, it's kind, kind of made, as if it would um, merit rewatching it, which mm. obviously when it was broadcast, you wouldn't be able to rewatch it because it was 1968. But it's obvious, you know, that, that maybe they flag stuff up a bit, in a bit more of an obvious way for people that are taking notice, you know. Yeah. So, um, goes to bed, doesn't he? Mm. And um, that's where we... We have the kind. Of, it's, it's really hard to explain because it's, it's almost like uh, something you would see in an art gallery. As, uh, um, <laughs> yeah. On loop. Um, yes. It's sort of slow motion. Slow. It's mode. horrible. Heartbeat sound effects. Yeah. Um, Michael Horner's sucking his thumb. And the, like weird back. Yeah, and then he's like. Yeah. It, it's it's really nightmarish. Yeah. 
Um, I reckon, yeah, I recommend you watch this if you haven't seen it because we will now yes. spoil what you actually <laughs> do see. So turn off now what, yeah. what you actually do see. Yes. Um, and it's 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 similar to what he's seen in his dream where it's, it's like um, the dream he saw almost like rags of material mm. shape, following, following him. along the beach. Yeah. Whereas here we see almost in slow motion the... The, the bedding, shit, the bedding. Up. yeah. Go on, James, you explain it. No, no, I was just saying that that's, that's how I would describe it to someone. The bedding rises up and starts to move around. Yeah. It doesn't say, and also it's like, nah, it's one of those things, it's where it's like, ooh, is, does seeing it lessen the impact? He said, because the sound works so well. Mm. And just seeing Michael Holden's response is yeah. so effective. It's almost like, yeah. for me, watching it for the first time, I'm like, that's the only bit that's aged. Interesting. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, no, I'm not... No, no, no. For I'm, me, I've always <laughs> loved the effect and never that's really cool. thought that... I just, it looks exactly like I've always imagined in the story, which mm. is probably, you know, why it works it's so well. It's so unlike anything you would ever, you've ever seen. Yes. Or seen uh, since. Um, mm. like, it's just very strange. It's very, it's, it is like a piece of surreal um, yeah, 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 cinema. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's what M.R. James does so well, is that his his stories are always the ghosts or the kind of, the thing which is the weird part of his fiction is always something that you've never really kind of heard of before yeah. uh, or seen, be- or not seen because that you're reading a story, but, you know, it's not something you've imagined before. So, you know, it's like binoculars that allow you to see into the past or it's um, a weird disembodied scream that pierces your brain out of nowhere mm. or, you know, it's this face which is just made out of crumpled linen um, so it, yeah, it's always it's something that's, yeah, just quite, quite out of the ordinary. Yeah. And this is, this is quite out of the ordinary. And then the, um, the major rushes in, uh, with the, yes. with the, some of the hotel staff and they just, um, try and help Michael Holden. Turn the lights on. Yeah. Who's and and, and turns kind of the lights episode. on, there's nothing there. No. Yes. Which gives you more the whole kind of in his head. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Breakdown. You know, yeah. I was thinking he had a stroke. And he's it. just going, oh no. no. Oh no. Oh no. And that's really quite scarring in itself, isn't it? Yeah. He's um, like reduced, reduced to a child, isn't he? Yeah. 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 Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, in the story, they make out that, um, they have a kind of de- debrief the next day and they assure everyone in the, um, uh, they, they assure everyone in the hotel that he's not, um, suffering from delirium tremens, which is mm, something to do with, yes. um, heavy drinking or something. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> As in the DTs. Mm, mm. Um, oh, yeah. okay. So yeah. And that's how it ends in the, in the, in the story is that, um, you know, he's kind of, um, he can't go anywhere and see a, a vicar surplus or whatever, a choir boy surplus without having the willies anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. So do you, do you want to mark them individually or do we mark Yes, them? I think so. Okay. Yes. So what do you want to give this one then, guys? It's brilliant. James. It's really, really good. Definitely, you know, for all the reasons we've outlined, four out of five. Four out of five for James. If anything, I would like it to be longer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. yeah that's... I would say this is a very strong five for me. So mm. it's up with the road. Yeah. Yes. And it's up with um, whatever else we've been. Yeah. Yeah. What I else? think, I think, whereas the road surprised me so much. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. With this, there was that degree of, well, I know what's coming. So I think, yes. but, but, but apart from that, but I did love it. Mm. Make no mistake. Yeah. I love it. And yeah. I highly recommend it. Yeah. Four out of five. Fantastic. Okay. What do you, what did you give it, Cleves? Uh, five, five out of five for me as well. Oh, yeah. So it, this is up there with the road, is it? Yeah. As a, as a. Oh, we everyone gave uh the road five out of five. I think. Mm, yeah. This is like strictly now, isn't yeah. it? That's good. That's good. That's that's, yeah, that's two like high final. quality things that I would genuinely give the thumbs up to. Okay, so that, that was quite a long one. So we can um well, we can say, well let's face it this ne- the next one is. It's like mystifyingly short. And I was going to mention yes. that in many ways. It feels like this is like the first half hour of a much longer drama. Yeah. And it's like, that's the end. Wow. wow it's okay. a very odd little nugget, isn't it? Yes. Where... Well, let, should we have James read the um, script and then we can... Go on then. Yeah, 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 yeah. So part two, stigma. 
is an episode of the BBC's A Ghost Story for Christmas series made in 1977, the year of my birth. Oh no my. Yep. And mm. Ross's. It was the first of only two stories set in the actual year of its making and the last which mainstay Lawrence Gordon Clark would direct. It was first shown on BBC One on the 29th of December 1977. Uh, postponed from its original scheduled broadcast date of 28th of December and was repeated mm. on the 29th of May 1978. Scripted by Clive Exton, the 30 minute piece stars Kate Pinchy, Peter Bowles, Big Peter Bowles, mm. and Maxine Gordon. The production was filmed at Avery, Wiltshire, virtually down the road for me and Ross. And also a place that, if you ever get the chance, go visit it. Better than Stonehenge by Mars. Right. Which is, it is also being used for the location for the ITV series Children of the Stones. Which is, exactly. Screened earlier that same year. Uh, the production Such a is, Scooby-Doo. <laughs> <laughs> the production is unlike the previous films of the Ghost Story for Christmas Strand in several ways. It's the first to be an original story and the first to be set in the then present day. So a contemporary story. Critical opinion is decidedly mixed with the decision to move away from adaptations of classic ghost stories, the main concern. So, yes, there you go. Yeah, so like we were saying earlier, this starts with um, a red sun in the sky. Mm. Um, very similar uh, beginning to um, uh, Whistle I'll Come To You, uh, which uh, goes into a... John, do you know what car it is? It's some kind of Citroen, wasn't it? Or is it... It's a 2CV. Is it a 2CV, yeah. It's 2CV. Oh, I don't like cars. He's got, a, he's got a 2CV. She has got a 2CV. And mm. Peter Bowles has got a Volvo, hasn't it? He has, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's a mother and a daughter. Um, are they... Dr- I couldn't work out. Are they just driving home? Or was it to a new they, house? They, or It's, it's to, to a new, new house, house, I think, isn't it? Yeah, because they yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. leaving the city. Yeah. Mm. They, so they talk about sort of leaving the city... The teenage daughter is very nonplussed about it, um, seems extremely unhappy and reticent like to Like all teenagers be, are. Bright red yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, she yeah, goes that, into the whole red theme for the... Um, she looks exactly like Callan's friend Carrie Evans um, at the time. <laughs> and whenever we watch it now, I say Carrie Evans and hell pisses herself. <laughs> um, <laughs> she does look exactly like Carrie Evans did at the time. Yeah. So I'm talking like 16 or something yeah, like yeah. that. And then they get to their new abode, which now this is mm. one of these things. If you've been to Avery, Ross, you've been, haven't you? I've driven through it. I never, oh, I didn't get out of the car. I, I need God. to, I need to go. Yeah. Right, I didn't John, get out of the now, car. Now, <laughs> I was busy. Now you see it at the end, John, mm. you can vouch. I know you've been, but, mm. but how they film it at the start, they make it look like it's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. The cottage yeah. is in the middle of nowhere. When they yeah. do the big shot at the end, you do see that it is part of a larger village, which insanely yeah. they just decided to build in the middle of this huge which is which is yes yeah. when I which went is to kind it, of the point I was driving really? to a recording studio to do some um, voice stuff or something at really? work um, well you were doing it no please. I was directing it for something <laughs> and um hi my name's Ross <laughs> welcome to Barkley Car <laughs> I think it was um, it might have been like instructions for like installing a garage door or something. it was something incredibly boring it wasn't for Garador was it it might have been I, can't, I don't know uh, it might have been it might, might not I did have been. work for I did a lot of work for Garador yeah. in the early noughties yeah, it might have been, you know. But, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> they're not far from there. They're in Somerset. They're, or in, Ye- they're, they're in Yeovil. They're, near, they're, near, they're in Yeovil. But, Home um, of the Yeovil sheepskin shop. I was driving was there drive early. <laughs> 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 and it was um, very misty and fr- uh, frosty. And, cool. and I was not aware that this place even existed. And I was driving through. Wow. There's a standing stone. Oh, there's another one. Oh, and then you just realise you're driving through the middle of a giant yeah. stone circle. Yes. It, 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 yes. it was incredible. Very spooky. It's, it's yes. amazing. It's, it's an amazing vibe. place, yeah. It's brilliant. And once again, dear listener, if you ever get the opportunity, you're not allowed to go up and touch Stonehenge anymore. Averbury, knock yourself out. They, they're very yeah, happy yeah, yeah. for you to go and touch them, climb upon them if necessary. Yeah. There's, there's no compunction Hug about them. it. Because, yeah. A lot of yeah. hugging. A lot yes. of hugging happens. Yeah, Ross, if we could do that thing that, you spit, that you've mentioned before, you could then insert a picture of me with my arms around one of the Avery stones, yeah, I'd love, yeah. which I have. And we, we, <laughs> yeah, well, yes, I remember what you're talking about, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I want us all to go there, but we, we, we just haven't got around to doing it properly. So. Yeah. We can but, go. Yeah. Um, it's quite far from me, though. So we, they, get to, they get to this cottage, which is in the middle of Avery, and you can see that they've got what I've put 
flares clad workmen. Yeah. That yeah. There's a lot of big flares <laughs> being, uh, being Stripping sported. off to their waist. <laughs> with, with completely unbuffed bodies. Yeah. Of course, yes. it was the 70s, Ross. Yeah, yeah. Was a like, bit like... It, um, there was only one man... Robin Asquith. <laughs> there was only one man who was muscular and ripped in 70s Britain. And you, yeah. Ross, you know it was Dave Prowse. Mm. Dave Prowse was the only man in Britain who was ripped. Well, Jeff Capes. I was going to say. Jeff Capes wasn't. He was just a mountain of a man. He <laughs> wasn't a, ripped. Just, just a fat man with muscles, isn't he, really? And budgies. <laughs> um, the house is very homely, and it's the kind of mm. house I wish I lived in, because it's oh. like, it's just, it looks like a house from my uh, ideal era of like, hmm. Oh, I was thinking I'd hate to live in that house. Mid seventies, yeah, why? Too. So small. Okay. I'll be banging okay, my head on the ceiling all the time. Oh, it looks great. <laughs> Nowhere to keep any of your stuff. And it, I'm a small person. It, it just stink. looks. It looks so cosy, and it's got like a belling cooker, and it's got like it hasn't got a fitted kitchen. It hasn't got any th- any of the shit things of modernity yeah. that you're told I, that you need. Really, I imagine this is what they think the cottage should have looked like in um, Beast's Baby. But yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. There's, there's yeah, a lot of an yeah. over. There's a big overlap between yes, those between these yeah. two. Yeah, yeah. And we're told that we, as they get to the house, we're told that we see these uh, our, our flares sporting workmen. They're trying to move <laughs> one of the ancient stones from the garden. The because, garden, uh, yes. Basically, because the, the reasoning given is that it'll spoil the lawn. And I thought that was, even though it, it's, it's such a brief half an hour thing, I thought that's that whole thing of. Not giving, not caring about the past, oh, not yes. interested in the heritage. Me and Beth, we watched this together. Just, we were both very angry the fact that someone tried to move a, a, a stone exactly. out of their garden. I'll be thinking that exactly. would be the, the reason I'd buy the house. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> right. It, I don't think, in the defence of Peter Bowles and his wife, it's not named as Avebury in the no. thing, though, is it? No. So it's no. just like this stone could be anywhere, and it just happens to be in their garden, and it's like. You know, this might be a World Heritage Site, but I don't want that stone in my garden. Yeah, well, but I was thinking, would you be even allowed to touch that stone? If no, it's in your I was say, probably so, not. There's, there's, some, there's a lot of things about the 70s that come up in this. One of them, we'll come to it in a minute, is as they're trying to manoeuvre the stone, one of the watchmen, yeah. go, one, of, one of the watchmen, one of the workmen goes to the other, watch your fingers. And I put, <laughs> that was health and safety in the 70s. Yeah. I was expecting this to turn into some kind of like, um, you know, uh, one of those public information films where someone yeah. gets, gets yeah, crushed and then yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At yeah. the start, are they doing it with um, just crowbars or or do they have a tractor? No, they have a tractor. There is a digger, yeah. which and is that's that whole like, kind um, of industrial over the yes. nature. Yeah, they cut, to, they cut to it a couple of times as they're coming in. So it's almost like they're yes. foreshadowing that thing. And then do in. they, uh, later on, they come back with a bigger tractor, don't yes. they? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes, I thought so. So, as, so we, we see them trying to manoeuvre this out of the way. And, mm. and I think the most interesting thing that, that struck me about was is that they go out of their way. There's not mm. been much soundtrack up until this point. No. But then they go out of their way to have them listening to the radio, mm. which is a about news Voyager, bulletin yeah. about the Voyager probe. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes! Carrie Hunt on the last phase of the Voyager mission. And the very fact that Voyager will by this time have left Earth so far behind offers us, according to David Hughes, one more unique opportunity. What we will mainly see when we look back at the Earth is the man-made radiation coming from us. And this will give us a better hope at interpreting peculiar radiations that we see from planets around stars that might have civilization. Quite a few people have been looking with large radio telescopes to see if they can pick up signals from other civilizations. We don't even know what's coming out from the Earth yet, so we don't really know what I find the idea of life elsewhere in the universe rather comforting. So let's hope David Hughes is right and Voyager can, in some small way, actually be finding it. Incidentally, on the off chance that the Voyager craft itself. Come on. And I, thought, I don't remember that at yeah, all. It was yeah, really yeah, gave yeah. me big sort of um, uh, figure of the, the last crater mass, the ITV crater mass. Mm. With big I stone thought that, and I just thought it was that kind of supposed oh, to be like a contrast between the ancient and the modern rocks. Yeah, yeah. But I thought, oh, they're, they're, this yeah. must be a choice because it goes on for so long. Yeah, it's and not I, was, like I was waiting for that to come snippet. back into it somehow. Or, or are we talking about Vija here? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, um, yeah, Vija, Vija when it comes back. 
<laughs> yeah, it comes back into the solar system. And the mistake that the stupid robot planet have made yeah. is that the, the words have been... Yeah, because, because there was nothing in its programming which said Voyager, wasn't it? The only way it was getting possibly identified is just by what was written on it. V G E R Feature V O Y A G E R Voyager Voyager Six. NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Jim, this was launched more than 300 years ago. Voyager series. By like a and, number plate on it. And by listening to the music of Chuck Berry. In, 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 in <laughs> <the Bible. laughs> Filming Chuck women. Berry. Filming women having a piss in, in the toilet. <laughs> by um. Pay me in cash. <laughs> Pay me in cash. That's one of my, my ding a ling. By the way, you know, for everyone, this is uh, in case you don't know the story. Um, the, uh, Robert Zemeckis tells the story about how they got <laughs> Johnny B. Good to, into Back to the Future. Is that basically they approached Chuck Berry or Chuck Berry's lawyer yes. or legal, and they said, "Look, he, he he's okay with it, but you have to give him the money." It's not just like, okay, yeah, right, fine. And then, you know, we'll pay you. He wants a briefcase full of money. Amazing. He will allow you to use Johnny yeah. B. Good for a set figure. And I, yeah. I can't remember if Zemeckis says how much it was, but he's like, yeah. and now come and give me the money. And then you, and they met up in a restaurant and apparently he had like a briefcase full of money. He's like, give me the cash. And he, and he counted it and he went, yep, fine. <laughs> I, from <laughs> yeah, now on, I want to be paid like that. That's right. In a briefcase full of cash, count yeah. it in front of me. Right for whatever I do. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. It's, it's a great sign. I think my I think my mother-in-law told me the story um, uh, last weekend. Said that whenever her dad bought a car, he would buy it in in cash, but he yeah. would always offer them under the amount because yeah. he said they were saying no. But until you, when you start getting the money out and like counting mm. in front of them, people get so greedy about seeing it, they could often get yeah. it for, for cheaper. Just always, That's, always. I, th- I think it's like a. a almost a generational thing or something that's dying out because back in my days of working in borders back in, in the bookshop people yeah. would constantly be saying well, can, you, can you do it less for cash I'm what like, no yeah 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 loads in a bookshop yeah 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 like so if, let's say people bought like four books so at the time coming to like 35 40 quid yeah you know you scan them through the till and you go that's 39 pounds please and they go can you do it less for cash they're like <laughs> no <laughs> it's 39 pounds oh I just thought I'd ask and I thought, what is this? But I think it, it must have been a thing. In the, I, I can in, remember uh, be, being in a job where, which I really hated, and then I worked out how much money I was getting like per hour. And then I would have just mm. imagined that someone putting that amount of money on the table mm. every hour, mm. and that, that mm. made me feel better about that's, being there. That's what I, exactly what I used to do in MVC. That it was literally just the cash mm. going into my pocket. But I I have tried that in Waterstones, James. But it's for <laughs> books that are marked or damaged oh, in some way, okay. not Fair just a, a book with a price on it. That- yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. used to happen a lot. But anyway, wow. So, oh god. Have we so got think, to the woman cooking a side of beef yet? Not yet. I mean, In a moment. <laughs> because they come back the next day with a bigger crane. Bigger. Bigger. And they, she, as, as they're starting to lift the stone, she comes mm. out with what I've put, uh, peak 70s tea mugs. Mm. That, those kind of beige <laughs> mugs that she brings out are very 70s. That's yes. my childhood on screen right there. Yeah. And as she's sort of bringing the, uh, the tea out for the workmen, who by this point have... Stripped, stripped off, off to the bare waist. It's a serious job, yeah. this. Yeah. Um, they lift the stone slightly. Mm, and and a big gust comes out, doesn't it? Almost. It's like a lo-fi end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, yeah. really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Something comes out, a, a yes. long suppressed darkness. Go back to your IBS, John. <laughs> rushes out. We don't see it. It's just... <laughs> it's it's just represented as a wind. And the, the mother of the family is sort of caught full on by it. And she just sort of stands mm, there. Yeah. <laughs> Poor cow if it's oh, my yes. IBS. 
long suppressed darkness. darkness. <laughs> and then <laughs> I had some Greek food. <laughs> that could be the darkness's comeback album. Mos- title, no. <laughs> <laughs> she wonder, She goes back into the house. She's all over. The, she's clearly all over the show. Piece of bowls rings yes. up, and then she just keeps going. No, I'm fine. And I'm yeah. just, you're, you're, Hello, you're, darling. Why well, no, we don't hear him? And he's not on it. Peter Bowles here. He's not on it for fucking ages. That's right. Well, he? He's like a big cameo, isn't he? No. He's, He's probably yeah. filming to the man of Bond. Was that yes. available? <laughs> no, or, um, only when I laugh. He would have been at that time. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. Or Survivors. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I yeah. didn't know he's in Survivors. I've never actually seen the old. He's one. in the. He's in the first episode of Survivors, and he dies. No oh. <laughs> spoilers. So after her not really convincing Peter Bowles that she's fine, we then get some like some scenes which are once again they're, they're almost like sort of experimental European art house in a way, and I think there's some. Is this where the walls are cracking? And yeah, like but also the, just like long yeah. scenes of her just sort of staring at things. Yeah. And then like yeah, long she, shots yeah. of kitchen equipment, which yeah. I think was yeah. all supposed to. I, I was trying to sort of give them the benefit of the doubt. I thought this is supposed to be show them that the, the world is awry, but something's gone wrong. Or that maybe mm-hmm. she's been possessed by someone she's been, or, or something mm. is now seeing the world for, through new eyes I, yes it's 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 a definite case of possession yes. i think in this and she starts sort of looking around and then this is the bit when she sees like a joint of beef is that the bit when <laughs> <laughs> and, and she just kind of stares at the beef for ages doesn't she? yeah an enormous amount of meat huge. for like three people it's huge it's basically a cow. Yeah. yeah. There's it's so like much blood got, in that bag yeah. as well. Oh, it's disgusting. 70s. I've stopped eating I've stopped eating beef recently and I and I don't know how I'd feel about watching this again because it is like literally half a carcass mm. in a Tesco carrier bag or something, yeah. isn't it? It's really weird. It's, sometimes when you look at things like that, you, you suddenly think, oh, hang on, it is weird that we eat a massive hunk of animal. bloody yeah, flesh. flesh, which yeah. someone's cut off of an animal somewhere, and then, yeah. you know, you've transported it home in, in a yeah. bag. It, yeah. it is very strange when you think about it. it. Now, this is strange, also yes. the point when she then, the mother, starts to develop like she's just got like blood on her face and stuff all of a sudden yeah and, and we see that she's got some form of stigmata that she's got a bleeding wound yes which quite surprisingly for the 70s this necessitates a basically getting getting her boobs out well uh, you say that james they got their tits out all the time well, in the 70s uh, yeah, and 80s. Right. On, on tv on the bbc yeah because i watched cracker yeah, the other okay. day I, I watched the first series of cracker That's the 90s. and it's like yeah boop, that's the 90s, yeah. This is 1977. Yeah, it just... I felt like- when I first saw this, I was really quite scandalised mm. by the amount of gratuitous nudity yeah. in this. Beck was I was saying, very shocked. I watched this with my wife. She said, oh, cool, here we go. Got to get the boobs out. She, yeah. she was distressed by but the woman's bra. She said it was... Um, the straps were t- uh, done up 70s. too high at the back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the fact that she had her tights on underneath her knickers. Oh, she, yeah, she, she, really yeah. weird. She thought uh, that was a strange... Um, yeah. Yes, and and this is when you have these sort of conversations you have with your long term partner. It's like <laughs> things like if you hear a noise, if I hear a noise downstairs, and I go downstairs and I see a knife move, do I go and wake you up afterwards? And she, she <laughs> and it was like, if it's a weekend, yes, but if it's a weekday, don't. And so it's like you put that in your little book of things, mm. things to, to do. It. Um, you know, uh. Would you would you be freaked out if you had lots of blood and you couldn't find out where it's coming from? <laughs> yeah. Or or would you just disguise it all yeah. and pretend everything was and fine? Wash your yeah, bra. And never tell anyone. And and, and, and ha- wash your bra and have a nice dinner. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> with Peter Bowles. So that, so so the mother then as, as this kind of stigmata, she continues to bleed. You know, she tries to to hide it. Again, it, more kind of very art house shots of the house. All of a sudden, yeah, as John says, there's a point in which like the house kind of vibrates and sh- vibrates and shakes. Yes. There was a, a shot when you see blood coming through something, yes. and I thought it was the ceiling originally, but it, I think it's, it's supposed to be coming through her skin. skin. Yeah, it's coming through her flesh. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, was, that was done quite well. Mm. Um, that effect But then when, it, good, when actually, it does the... It? And, and the, the, the mirror cracking, <laughs> the daughter walks in, yes. that's giving you the feeling like, Nothing weird has happened. This is all from mm. no. the mum's it's yeah, in the it's mind the mum's of... perspective. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And you think, is yeah. this all happened because you saw the man with his top off in the garden? In the seventies. Well that yeah. is that seems to be the precursor of all this, that she's got desire towards, you know, the T V equivalent of Robin Asquith digging up a stone in a garden and she's gone a bit got had the collie wobbles. It's it, it, 
it is a bit ropey, this one. <laughs> I found it, it's very charming. It's all, it's all shot on 16 mil. Oh. So that's oh. absolutely fine. Damn. I didn't, I didn't need to bring up Spearhead from Space. Spearhead from Space at the beginning earlier, then, did I? I've just written down. Peter Bowles in a Volvo, exclamation mark. Yeah. Peter Bowles, yeah. finally, as John said earlier, <laughs> big Peter Bowles arrives yeah. in a Volvo as finally, finally turns, turns up, up two thirds of the way through and then, then follows like, to, where uh, the fuck have you been, Peter? To, to misogynistically um, have, have a go at her about like not being able to the open a bottle of wine properly. Bloody women, etc. Very late 70s. <laughs> and then there's a very odd scene where I've just put Peter Bowles is unnerved by the kitchen. That's it. That, yeah. that, that's <laughs> he just goes into the kitchen and goes and sort of looks things <laughs> like some rubber yeah. beans, which is a very seventies. He's vegetable. never been in there before. Yeah. You know, you know. But he's heard a noise, hasn't he? Last in the time night and he's got, oh yeah, beans. yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think I've ever eaten runner beans for over twenty years. Oh yeah, I love runner beans. Decades ago, I really like the seventies. Yeah, we used to grow them on the farm oh, in the garden. Okay, interesting. No, it's, yeah, we do the roast for the kids. Oh, all right, okay. Shout, um, shout on them to eat them. They don't eat them. Fuckers. But I was trying to work out the, the, the onion seems to be the most significant. Yes. <laughs> because he looks at the, the onion it, when he comes to the room, it's like the onion is dropped on the floor. Yeah. And the yes. knife. Yeah, and um and the knife is moving and the yeah. oven's on. And it looks like vegetables have been arranged in some mm, way. Yes. Um but then he just goes back to bed. And the, yeah. wasn't he woken up by the sound of dripping? And isn't that the, isn't it the blood dripping out of his? It's the blood oh. dripping out of his. Yes. Yeah. yes. So yeah. incredibly, it's like yeah. everything we've told you, you've not missed a scene, dear listener. We've told you absolutely every scene is in this thing. <laughs> what What I was going to ask, which I've just remembered, is do, do they say what his job is? Banking. Well, he, he works for the man at Hell House, doesn't he? So he's just Aye. he's just been telling those people who are going into like the. Because um... I was wondering, is he an antique dealer? Dealer, because a Volvo is an antique dealer's chariot, yes. oh. and you know, it's love Joy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <It's a tinker laughs> love Joy had a Morris Maynard called Daisy, didn't he? Where do you drag that out from? Right, I'm gonna put out my out of so my brain. I'm gonna look. As when he wakes up in the morning, he finds out that his wife's that the bleeding has continued and she's barely conscious. Yeah. He freaks out, gets the daughter yeah. who's also freaking out, and he's like, "Ring a doctor, ring a doctor, ring an ambulance for Sam. God's sake, <laughs> ring the." <laughs> right. And then completely not telling his daughter what's going on. Yeah, just ring the doctor. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, don't tell them what's happened. Just um, ring them. <laughs> there's a couple of great bits that happen. But number one, the doctor arrives. I'm bearing in mind that this woman is near death. He is the most nonplussed, I put unbelievable nonplussed behavior from a medical professional. Like he says, what is this? What's happening? And he just goes, I don't know. I yeah. Doesn't know what's going on. She goes in, her mum's bloody boobs are like on display. And, and they're sort of drag- <laughs> they were like dragging her around. Trying- she's unconscious. <laughs> and this is another thing. We, I said to Beck, do you reckon I could dr- I could carry you downstairs if you um, be bleeding or not? She's no, because I'd be a dead no. weight. And I was thinking, yes, oh, God, you I could. To- she's Beck's I, I, I get the, the, Hulk, the strength of Hulk, wouldn't Beck's I? I think. Tiny. It's a very odd and misogynistic kind of vibe, isn't it? And it's a bit disappointing from. Yeah. Gordon Law- Lawrence Clark yeah. or whatever his name is, because I really like his other stuff, but this is just like bloody. Mind you, actually, he didn't write this, did he? No, it was um, like, right. It's, it's, been, it's very phoned in. It feels, doesn't it? It's like what? Yes. What's the tick list for what we want from a ghost story? Ooh, some sort of ancient curse, a bit like we've just seen on Whistle and I'll Come to You. Ooh, uh, can we can we get stones. boobs into uh, that? A yeah. little bit of blood. Ooh, a little bit. Ooh, so some ghostly forces. Colour, we're have lots of lots of yeah, red. yeah. And it's like there um, you go. Right. So meanwhile, I was about to say, whilst being juxtaposed with her, and then sort of calling the doctors, we've got the workman continuing to work on the stone. And th- don't worry about the noise in the house and the screaming. <laughs> and just, amazingly, and they, they're they aware it's happening out, because they talk mm, about yes, it. That they find out that yeah. obviously there is a skeleton beneath this stone that someone yeah. yes. has either been killed by having the stone dropped upon them, or this person Ooh. was buried down there Ooh. and then they then put the stone upon them to keep in the darkness, whatever it may be. And now, well, yeah, well, we find. Oh, yeah, we find well, that out. That's we? what I was so, about to say. Here's our bit. First of all, and this is. Call back to one of our earlier episodes, everyone. Brace yourselves. I've put 
What's that? It's a knitting needle gone rusty. And I put, you're a country <laughs> lad. You know what a knife is. <laughs> <laughs> Come exactly. on, mate! A knitting needle gone rusty. It's a oh. knife. But they, the first thing they do when they see the skeleton, first, if you found a skeleton, <laughs> but the first thing you do is pull the skull off yeah. and have a look oh, at look it. Look at that! I, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, right, one. I'd Alas, be too, Phil, you're a. I'd be too yeah. squeamish to touch yeah. it, but also yeah. I'd be like, I'd be so excited about getting like Penny Robinson in my garden <laughs> to have a look at this thing. <laughs> And I'd be like, don't touch it, don't touch any of it. This is all like needs to be preserved. But this is the seventies, like all yokels, and they just put put a knife out of them. Yeah, Yeah. I would prefer the guy from Villages by the Sea to come and look at it. I think he used to be on with Tony Robinson, but um, I don't like Tony Robinson. Helen and I once (laughs) saw him in a Jaguar, in uh, a soft top Jaguar in Bristol with a young woman. He was driving past the uh, railway station, and we were like. Look at him, champagne socialist, well, driving around my, in a fucking... Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was about to say, well, I've got a Tony Robinson story for you too. My very first girlfriend, <laughs> Claire, lovely, lovely Claire, who she once said to me, oh, um, he crashed into my mum's car. Uh, not in a jag. jag or a, whilst sort of reversing out of a car park, and she saw him do it. Scum. And then when she tried to say to him... Oi, you've just, you know, can I have your insurance detail, please? He went, oh, can I just give you a signed yeah. picture instead? <laughs> <laughs> that just stayed with me. I told that story in 1996, people. Yeah. Scum. Some Champagne scum. socialism. <laughs> <laughs> James, Subhuman scum. Just while you're at it, tell the story of um, Paul Daniels going into a fish and chip shop. Hang on a minute. I found Lovejoy's car. Lovejoy's car was called Miriam, not Daisy, sorry. Oh, but it was a soft top Morris Minor, so I was Yay. right. Yay! Congratulations. To, to some extent. Carry on, James. No, no, no. Who was it? I Phil, don't know this. Phil Daniels going into a chip Paul shop. Daniels. Paul Daniels. I don't know that story. Paul Daniels, not Phil Daniels. You said your, your sister was in a, in a fish and chip shop when Paul Daniels came in wearing a hat and a cape and just said, <laughs> no, you can't make a point of what, what is that incredible, what is this incredible smell? And he had, and his life spoke with magic, with, with uh, the eye was a, a number I've one. never told you, you <laughs> dreamt that, mate, you dreamt that, I've never told you that story. <laughs> I dreamt that? I'm sure I've you told, told me that you story. That story. <laughs> I have never. <laughs> <laughs> This is a Mandela effect. <laughs> now you're saying I remember it, but I don't think that's a member of my family, Ross. I don't think that's... I'm sure you said your sister no. was in the fish and chip shop when he, he no. sort of flung the door no, open. No, 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 Amazing. <laughs> wow. Okay, I'll, I'll have to, I'll have to think on the, that one for the, you, people. I'm sorry. No. Although I see... That's the most um, general Witchfinders moment compressed it's, it's a, well, I, that we've ever my, done. Lovejoy. What? Yours. Phil Daniels, Paul Daniels, James, <laughs> and, uh, a dream. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say that today, my nemesis, my local nemesis, the Bournemouth uh, Echo, one of their dreadful, <laughs> dreadful, <laughs> poor, poor clickbait journalism stories today is Dorset twins who have brought Paul Daniels to pay. Yes. Oh, I amazing. You about that, didn't I? Yeah, you did, Cleves. I thought you were going to buy it. Oh, no. Inverted commas. Absolute. Well, How good. much did it cost? It was like 30 grand, wasn't it? Oh, whatever. 30 yeah. grand for a toupee? It was, it was a magic toupee. Look, de- <laughs> the look, magic Debbie, toupee. Debbie McGee lives a champagne life skirt style. That don't fund itself. Sh- <laughs> Debbie McGee needs money for something because there was so much yeah. Paul Daniels stuff up for sale recently. Well, what's the what would she keep? What's, for, what's Martin Daniels that? got on her? <laughs> <laughs> He's like the in all this. We haven't heard from him in a while. Oh, he used to have his own show, is. didn't he? And then what happened to that? Mm. All I remember is he he also <laughs> did. Hey, oh man, I don't know if you have to cut this out or not. I'm sorry, but I remember that he did a thing like in that same way, like that amazing one that Paul Daniels did, where they genuinely made it look like he died. And they like faded, yeah. faded black briefly with the, Iron Maiden. with the Iron Maiden. There was also one that Marty Daniels did with like a drowning thing, like a Houdini thing that Paul Daniels was there for and going, it's gone wrong. Stop it. Stop it. And like, <laughs> I remember that. I mean, that might be a Mandela effect. But him like trying to stop the trick, which of course was all part yeah. of the trick. But yeah, that's my only thing of Martin Daniels and his bouffant How hair. scarring yeah. television. It's great. Yeah. Martin Daniels is, is 59. No way. 
No Yeah, he's way. a member of the magician circle, I'd he, He's the, a member of the Grand Old Order of the Water Rats. Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, that, I've Illuminati. always thought, is a bit like a uh, nuisance, isn't it? Yeah, for yeah. The showbiz. Joe Pasquale. <laughs> After opening a club. <laughs> <laughs> With all of his tattoos. After opening a club in the United States in 1989, he was declared bankrupt four years wow. later. That's a, uh, he has since worked in radio, presenting a show for BBC Radio Lincolnshire ooh. and performed in pantomime and continues to perform magic on stage. <laughs> One of the things she could have um, bidded for on that auction was Paul Daniel's um, membership card to the Magic Circle. You think, like, really? Why are you get rid of, rid of this stuff, Debbie? Yeah, you know, this is yeah. Yeah. this needs to be dedicated this is good to stuff. the nation. Debbie McGee is sixty-four, so there's not much difference between Debbie McGee and um, whatever he's called, Martin Daniels. Martin Daniels, they, they could be married to each other, couldn't mm, they? I'm it's sure. only five years difference. I'm sure. You know, I've, I've seen videos. Martin Daniels and Johnny Marr are the same age. They should go on tour together. Wow. <laughs> now, this is, a, they, 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 this is just a... Oh, don't put this on the, on the podcast because it's so an aside, but I just thought, I love this story. This is great. I don't know if you know it, John, but there was a thing the other day, just thinking about when people having to put up auction things on auction for money, and then, you know, when yeah. you then get the benefacts and buy it. Uh, uh, yeah. Apparently, there was a story saying that Cynthia Lennon had to sell, like, a load of uh, John Lennon's handwritten lyrics to something. Mm. And apparently, it went to auction. A private bid- bidder won it for, like, big money. I'm going to say something like quarter of a million mm. or something like that. And then she got the money. A couple of weeks later, in the post, the lyrics turned up. Note from Paul McCartney just saying, these are yours. Oh, no way. And it just, it just gave wow. me straight back to her. I thought, what That's a top man. Isn't it? What a top man. Yes. It's got nothing to do with general budget. Yes. I mean, I'm just like, oh, it's going in though. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah okay. leave it in. Leave yeah, it in. We love yeah, Macca. He's brilliant. He's a top top man. Anyway, right. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. So, back soon. <laughs> We've we got to get this done. We've got to get this done now. That must be the most, most uh, uh, tangent, that we've tangent, ever diverted from. A <laughs> <laughs> Huge tangent. Fantastic. Anyway, so yes, um, they then uh, said the workmen start realizing that there's a load of knives. It's a rusty needle. Although as they start pulling them out, they're so clearly knives. Oh, there must be yeah, a load knife of knives. Each corner, in each corner of the each grave, corner, there's a yeah, knife. Yeah. British workmen. And then one in the ribs. And that's where the... Um, She's been bleeding yes. from, but they can't find the wound. Yes. Um, so, is, meanwhile, the rubbish doctor has gone, oh, well, we best get her to a hospital then. <laughs> Don't wait for the ambulance! <laughs> just like now. Just get her in just the like now. Once again, broken Britain, failed state. You know, you've got to wait like yep. three days yeah. for an ambulance now. Yep. They get her... Nine hours freezing. Exactly. They get her into the back of Peter Bowles' Volvo, start driving off to the nearest hospital, which I'm guessing will probably be Salisbury. Southampton. Southampton yeah. at that point. A lot, it, it'd be a, a long, long way drive from, from, from uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, without any real feeling that she's passing away, or that she's dying... Well, he's, given, he's, given really hor- he's given a really horrible mouth-to-mouth <laughs> in the back of the car. Very, Is very it? close up, yeah. and like, I was, I was mimicking the noises to Beck to freak her, to gross her out. <laughs> Scenes from because a marriage part sound, but... three. Yeah. <laughs> She's a lucky lady, Ross. <laughs> Who it? Is it Peter Bowles doing it? Or the doctor? Doctor. Doctor. Bowles oh. is driving. Oh. Peter Bowles is driving the Volvo. Because, yes. and then all of a sudden, yeah. Bowles just goes, "Oh no!" No! No! Oh, pull into a, pull into a, a light, uh, lay by. by. Lay by, yeah. Yeah, yeah she's gone. Because she's dead. Yeah. She's gone. No! Oh, no! And then... No! <laughs> cut back then we have to... a helicopter shot. No, no, yeah, no, we love no, the hel- helicopter oh. shot. Oh, really? Before we jump, we've just got slightly out of sequence. We jump back <laughs> to Averbury, where <laughs> they're talking about how... The workmen are talking about how weird the grave is. And then the daughter goes, it's what they used to do to witches. And she's gone like mm. kind of weird, hasn't yeah, she? I read it in a book. And then she went, yeah. that's what they would do to people they would accuse of being a witch. And they look at her and then she just goes, I read it in a book. And she's holding the onion. Yeah. Thus, and, and what's the onion? Oh, yeah. The, the, the suggestion, yeah. I don't know. Because again, at any point, have we seen her reading a book or anything? I, I, you know, has she in mm. some way, in the same way that the mum kind of took on 
the curse that she received something yeah. too. And it looked like she was going to start now transferred to her. To her. Yeah, and it looked like she was going to peel the onion. Yes. And I was thinking, okay, is it going to have blood in the onion? Maybe. And then, and then no. And then they cut away and then it to the, the helicopter to, shot. Uh, yeah, yes. and then it cuts back to Peter Bowles going to go, oh! and then we get the helicopter shot. Oh! Of, and it, 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 these days it'd be a drone shot. The, but it's, it's quite an expensive yeah. helicopter shot. If we see the cottage and <laughs> like as, the end of time, yes. It. And then, as as we see, as mentioned earlier, you actually see that it's part of Avonbury Village, and you can see the, the, the yes that there are more of the stones, which I guess yeah, for this it is a it's a great helicopter. It is, shot, it is to be fair. And although yeah. I get the feeling it was, they were kind of suggesting that it's like, oh, maybe there's more of these things under every one of these stones. <laughs> but yeah, it's just weird. This is quite strange. As you said, it's like a. Ch- a- I enjoyed really? it. Oh, yeah, that's quite I, I enjoyed it. It's quite a well oh. Yeah. So, uh, what, what, you, what score are you going to give that one then? I'm I'm really very fond of it, and I'd give it a oh, three okay. out of five because it is a it's a jolly run <laughs> and it's a bit daft. <laughs> There's nothing really wrong with it. I mean, it's a bit misogynist yeah. and it's a bit daft, but in itself, it's a, it's quite a good time capsule, mm. really. What did you say, uh, Jane? The John? Four? Three. 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 And did you give it three as well, I'll give it two. Two. Um, I'm going to give it a four. For half, yeah, for half an hour, it, it passes the time. Um, the lady is weirdly ah. attractive. What more can I say? So, have we got um, anything um, horrific? Do. Something horrific this week? Ross, have you got... Mm. Um, we have Secret Santa at work, and whoever my Secret Santa was, I didn't discover it was, got me this nice book here Same. called... Um, oh, oh, that's a good Tales idea. Tales of Folk Horror. Um, yeah. But the, the one I'm reading at the moment is brilliant. Um, it's not mm. particularly short. Let me see, what's it called? Um, it's called The Great God Pan. Arthur Mashin. Arthur... Mansion, yeah. Yes. Have, you, have you read that one? Before? I have. Yes. Yeah, it's. Re- I haven't finished it yet, but I, I really love the way it's kind of telling the story. Of, it's telling a story from like the peripherals of people who have been touched by whatever the hell was going on. Mm, so like, yes. uh, like some guy. You, you hear the story of some guy who's married to this yes. woman. You hear the story of someone who was brought up with the, this mm. woman as a child, and and it's kind of implied. I, it feels like it's some, something like the Babylon working or One something like of that, the sort of thing. My, my favourite living philosopher, John Gray, who is brilliant, although a little bit miserable when I met him, slightly disappointingly, um, he says that, and mentions Arthur Mashin a few times in his work, saying how way ahead of his time he was. And I read Arthur Mashin because John Gray wrote about it. Okay. Yeah, really yep. enjoyed it. I haven't finished it yet, though. Living in Wales, yeah. I would say that it's Arthur Macken. Macken, all right. Oh, okay. Macken. There you go, thank okay. you. I stand absolutely properly correct. Because I think he was yes, Welsh. Yes, yes, was yes, he yes. Yeah, and lots of stuff. Lots yeah, of yeah, yeah. Same Wales. It's Macken. Yes. I should, I should uh, say I've okay. read quite a few, but I think it's, uh, it's um, uh, Arthur Macken. Oh. So have you read this one, Jane, uh, John? What's it called? The Great God Pan. No, I know of it, and I think the British Library have done a whole of one of their compendiums mm-hmm. about uh, pan stories. But I may even own I read- it. I, I, I went for a stage of <laughs> just buying all of them. And I, but I'm, not, I'm not sure if I've got that. I one. read a really good Arthur Macken story, Macken story uh, a while ago. A lot of his stories are about a journey through a kind of weird experience, aren't they? Where he goes into a house and there's people there and then they turn into different people and... Yeah, very interesting writer, but um, no, I don't know that one. Um, did he do the White People? Is that what it's called? Did he? Read, did he write? Well, who wrote Randall's Round? Not. No, no, no. no. Well, you got, I, I don't remember. No that's idea. not. That's not him. Mm. Yeah, so I'm enjoying that at the moment. Um, and the, one other thing I, I want to mention is an excellent um, thing I found on Twitter, uh, which mm. uh, called um, t- uh, Textiles unexpected oh yes which is basically someone's done a uh, an analysis of all the different um textiles in uh beasts episodes uh beast baby uh-huh. which we've um uh, so it's, they go through all the different laura ashley patterns and all the different outfits the mm. the patterns on the on the um on the uh sofas and all that kind of stuff just 
I just love the minutia someone's gone into to all of that research they've done on that one episode. So. Definitely. Awesome. Good. James, I have do. you got us something horrific this week? On the last time I went to Glastonbury, and a bookshop that you all three of us went in together, I popped back in, I was like, I'll have some of that. Yeah, I got yeah. that. I, I think Ross may, I said Ross may have it already. Um, the magazine, uh, the small press magazine, Hellbore, who are excellent. By the way, we, we thoroughly recommend Hellbore. Um, it is their guide to a cult Britain, which straight away I was like, it, this is destiny. Because they just had a pile of them on the table in that, you know, in, a, in that big glad- bookshop in Glastonbury. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> and I, I was personifying a cult Britain. Yeah, I was like, yeah. And I was like, well, this is destiny. And this is for us in many ways, shapes and forms. But just, just from the back, I was like, this is our interest in so many ways. Exploring castles, museums, and manor houses, megaliths, moors, mountains, and lakes, this lavishly illustrated travel guide covers the rich history of magic and the occult in Britain, and Northern Ireland, and its inextricable form in the landscape. Delve into a world of witchcraft, ancient rituals, and cult ceremonies, from the ancient stone circles of the Cornish Moors, wealthy manor houses of Hampshire, from the windswept headlands of Northumbria to the golden streets of Oxford. From the turbulent Scottish Cordons to the rugged Causeway Coast, this guide ventures into hundreds of locations. With magical links, it's called the works of authors and creators, inspired by their strange human beauty, the lives of the occultists, witches, and cunning folk who inhabit it, and legends that persist. That's so. That's the book that inspired my other podcast, the Dark Darset podcast. Yeah. Mm. And bearing in mind that we've just been talking about, you know, MR James and all the rest of it. Um, during our little break that we, that, that we had, uh, there here is just a bit on the spirit of the fens, as we mentioned. So yeah, check check this out. Their isolation made these fertile marshy areas excellent sites for religious communities in the medieval period. But the lens, uh, sorry, the fens of East Anglia can be dangerous places, notorious for disappearances and outbreaks of malaria. They're also prone to self-igniting gases known as willow the wisps which has sparked many, many oh. legends and superstitions. Whistling in the fens is frowned upon as it attracts mm. the lantern men, glowing spirits who lure victims to draw around in the reed beds. If you see the eerie lights of a lantern man, the solution is to lie face down, mouth open to the mud until the phenomenon subsides. The toadmen of the fens were said to have sold their souls to the devil with a ritual that involved catching a male toad and hanging it until its bones had been picked clean. Once dried, the bones were thrown into a running stream on a full moon at midnight. All bones except one would be swept downstream. The remaining bone would guarantee psychic control over horses. A useful skill to have in these marshy areas. I was like, so what Excellent. a guy. Fantastic. So that's why. There's a great one in that. I can't remember where it is, but there's this manor house where um when the the guy uh, who owned it um, sold it to the National Trust, the National Trust found a secret room up in up in a, in a tower with like a pentagram on the ground and all like all his magical accoutrements all around this. Obviously, he was doing some kind of work cool. up in there and just left all the stuff there. And um, unfortunately, you're not allowed access to that room. And all of the um, magical items were put into a, a museum. But I thought, ah. Oh, I would have loved to go on. Imagine if you found that, if you were the one who, who found that secret staircase and found... Oh, any any that. secret staircase I'm a fan of. At the end of yeah, it's an excellent book. Hey! John, what are you coming up with? Last night, I downloaded from Amazon The Moon Dial from 1988. Oh, uh, yes. Made by BBC Television yeah. Pictures. I, I, I own this as well. We need, to, oh, we need to do a podcast on this. I think we should cover it because it's really amazing. I haven't seen it since it went out. Yeah. Um, first episode's mental, isn't it? Yeah. I really love the first episode. Uh, the music has stayed in my mind yeah. since 1988. Um, Helen Criswell, isn't it? Yes, what really stuck with me is something that, um, well, Russell T. Davis has said a lot about um, TV in this era, and obviously he was started to write TV in this mm. era. How much money they had to do this stuff and to do it correctly. Mm-hmm. 
And I think we're really lucky to have grown up at this time when there was a national broadcaster putting this stuff out at tea time to kids like us. And it probably changed our lives mm, yep. in some ways because you're watching this and you're like, this is, this is brilliant. Mm. Like no expense bed dramas made for children going out on a national broadcaster at tea time about a supernatural thing. About parents dying in car crashes. And- yeah. And it's really beautifully made. It's really well acted. And you're just like, what do kids have to watch these days? I, I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, what do they watch, Cleves? What do your YouTube My, kids YouTube. have? They love YouTube. Doctor Who. Can, yeah, no, but I'm I'm saying contemporaneously now. What do they have to watch? Uh, they that's watch. On? They watch something. Um, thing about some superhero turns and it's like a uh, a lady bird who fights. Uh, uh, um, yeah, and uh, is that on CBBS now or oh, whatever it's called? God knows what channel they what they, they just got so many yeah. streaming things. Yeah. They, they watch this really good thing from Australia called Investigators, where they solve a crime. That, that's yeah. quite good. But yeah, I tried to get them to watch things like that series of Dodger with um Chris Eccleston. They're not, not interested yeah. in that. I tried to get them to watch that Hetty Feather thing. When weren't, weren't, weren't interested in that, but I have no idea what either of, either of these things. But one are, thing but I, I do watch a lot over and over and over again is the first episode of the Dark Towers. <laughs> <They> just, <laughs> oh, really? Really? Yeah. I think that, you know, we were just really lucky to have, you know, people say, oh, remember when there was only four Ooh. channels? And it was like, yeah, four channels full of excellent yeah. content yeah. Yeah. and really good programs. Whereas now, a thousand channels full of absolute yes. shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got a record player, which I haven't used for 20 years. Just wondering if you can turn it into a bus <laughs> or a car. <laughs> And then it'll be a story of how someone is going to like turn their record player into like a something that can mix um, uh, cocktails for them or something. I, I think it was just uh, that. <laughs> Cleaver's obviously watching uh, different channels. Yeah, I, think I, yeah, I don't watch <laughs> channels. <laughs> I don't mention this to my A level students. I say, well, you know, it's like when I was your age, I said to you, know, we were told about the gatekeeper model of the media that, that you know, there was uh, all of these different stories or different, these different ideas or pitches for programs. And you would have a gatekeeper say, is that good enough to get on? And just like that, mm. that, that, yeah. that, the internet has made 100%. The good enough to get on bar no longer exists. Just put anything yeah. on YouTube, anything. Is put it any old shit on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just yeah. get it on. Yeah. Anything, it yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. 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 And yeah. like this podcast, yeah. for example. <laughs> yes. I think a democracy, what, what's called as a democratization mm. of the media has actually led to just standards dropping to nowhere. Yeah. And, and, and I was watching this, watching the mood, just thinking, this is really good. Yeah. Um, and it's a really quality item. And they made five or six things like this a year. Ooh, yeah, Children of Green No is one of my... Yeah, Children of Green No was on just before this, I think, 86. Yeah. And that's something I haven't watched yet. And I've never seen the last episode because I had to go to um, someone's birthday party so it's on I'm YouTube. Int- I, I watched the whole Is series really? last Christmas, and um, yeah. I was just crying all the way for it. <laughs> the box of delights as well is something else. Makes no fucking sense uh, if you watch it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very similar. <laughs> super, you know, similar era. Um, there and was I- something. There was a I, Robert Westall. Um, I got really yeah. Robert Westall. Was it the watch? The house. The machine gun. Yeah, the machine gun. Did. I, I read. I read that to my daughter recently. That mm. that's pretty harrowing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Good the stuff. devil on the road as well, which is yeah. very excellent and that should be made into something but it never will be now but um yeah i just think it just made me think god we were really lucky to live at a time where people gave a fuck and they made good quality tv for people rather than now which is just like just get it on uh <laughs> yeah content mm. over quality engineers they watch engineers all the time which is where someone uh, comes and builds a shed in the garden for the kids it, it, that's that's the thing. There's no narrative dramas no. made mm, anymore. Is there? It's all just like, uh, and that's what I'm saying about, you know, turn my record player into a cocktail machine or something. It's all like, it's, it's quite cheap television. And I think that's, that's the issue is that the um, expensive television isn't made anymore, really. Okay. Unless it's like the Mandalorian or like that's something scary. like that. Like the BBC was making stuff like that 30 years ago, just mm. for kids. Do you want, do you want me to put a uh, moon doll onto the, um, it's quite no. long. That's anything. We can't. Lo- long is maybe an episode yeah. of it. Yeah. 
Okay. Maybe to review like the the last episode or something, but not like uh, okay. uh, you know first and, six maybe episodes. first and last episode maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. but I think that brings us nicely to end of what what we are actually going to do next. Okay. Next, um, oh. next year. It is next time on mm. Jim Witchfinders. We're going to do another double Ooh. bill if I can convince the boys to do it. Mm. First will be Ghost Adventures, the ancient Ramy. Yes, <laughs> and we will be doing the most haunted New Year's Eve, New Year's yes! special from 2003 with Dick, from Dick Turpin. <laughs> Fantastic a, a, about Dick Turpin. So yes, it's Ghost Adventures from the ancient Ramy yes. and most haunted 2003 oh. New Year's Eve special. <laughs> what a way to kick off the new year! <laughs> <laughs> have you have either of you watched that no, Ghost right. Adventures episode? Not yet, no. <laughs> oh, the guy that runs the pub, like this ginger guy in a biker jacket who's like 140 years old and sleeps on the sofa. It's amazing. And the the way that the English people despise the American film crew is hilarious because <laughs> they just they're like you're you're just fucking idiots. Yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant. Well, that's what you guys got to look forward to next next time. Yes. Um, and I think this is interesting after we've just talked about the the, the, the death of narrative television and, and going on to reality mm. TV and basically yeah. we're watching two, two episodes of reality of TV, basically. Yes. But um, we will be coming back to Hammer and all that shit after that, so don't worry. But until yes. then, ha- Merry Christmas, Indeed. everyone. This will probably come out. I'm going to put this out on uh, Christmas Eve. Whoa. So, ho, Hooray. ho, ho. Merry Christmas. I hope you get what you want. Merry Christmas. Yes. And, Happy um, festive period, I hope you everyone. get your presents in the morning. And um, I hope you're visited by a demon <laughs> in the night. Yeah. I can't stop that. Amazing. Thank you for listening, yeah. everyone, as always. Yeah. Yes. Happy day. Love, light, and Bye. peace. You have been listening to The General Witch Finders. Support the show and continue the conversation at patreon.com forward slash general witch finders. Subscribe and spread the word at generalwitchfinders.com. Farewell. You don't have nightmares. Thank you.